In what ways has ASIJ affected who you are today? Some of which I'm conscious of and others that I'm probably not conscious of. Um, definitely, I think the ones that are conscious of is the, you know, the, 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 the teachers I had at ASIJ definitely made a big impact on the kinds of stuff I wanted to study and the, the kind of sort of professional trajectory I wanted to follow, I think. I definitely, you know, really had a, a lot of teachers that I can say um, inculcated me with uh, a, a, a good amount of critical thinking skills and, and, and taught me the importance of not taking anything um, at face value and questioning everything, right? Um, I wanna, you know, I'm thinking specifically of like Andrew Hoover and uh, Natalie O'Connor in middle school, um, Kathy Krauth and, and Bobby Ghosh in, in high school were all just like excellent uh, teachers in the social studies and history curriculums, curricula that that taught me the importance of, of of reading things and just like understanding you know the agenda of who's saying them or who's writing them and the importance of that even just like with textbooks for instance you know um, that just made me really curious and 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 interested in history and and sort of like the 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 way different histories are told how certain voices are elevated or erased depending on, you know, who's writing the history, things like that, I, I think, you know, um, definitely made me more curious in the social sciences and the humanities than in the, the STEM fields, for instance. Um, maybe that was just sort of like the kind of uh, person I was turning out to be at that point. But, um, but yeah, and, and I think in terms of more broadly, the sort of uh, the friends I had, um, the multicultural milieu of ASIJ definitely gave me a unique vantage point on life. Uh, welcome to episode 66 of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest is a senior editor of World Politics Review. Prior to joining WPR, he spent five years as a news producer at the Washington, D.C. Bureau of Tokyo Broadcasting System, Japan's oldest and largest commercial television and radio network. In that capacity, he was responsible for facilitating TBS's coverage of U.S. politics and foreign policy, and he reported from over 15 different countries and 25 U.S. states. Master's degree in international relations and international economics from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and a bachelor's degree in international affairs from the George Washington University. He speaks fluent Japanese and is conversant in Vietnamese. And it's not in his bio, but he did graduate from the American School in Japan in 2005 after attending the school for his primary, middle, and high school years. He was also a drummer for the renowned rock band, The Grape. Welcome to the <laughs> podcast, Elliot. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be here. Great to be with you. It's nice to see you, buddy. Um, today, many things to cover. Uh, you being a TCK, your work at WPR, mm -hmm. uh, ASIJ, Vietnam days, and so on. Well, let's start with what you're doing right now. Um, I've listened to some of your podcasts, very good stuff, as well as some of the articles you've, you've written. So uh, what do you do as a senior editor at World Politics Review? Thanks. Yeah, I should say thanks for checking out the podcast. Um, so my job is uh, a lot of things. I edit articles, uh, commission articles that we publish on worldpoliticsreview.com. Um, I should say for people who, have, who aren't familiar with us, um, WPR is a independent news site that focuses on um, analysis, news and analysis of international affairs from a perspective that we like to think is very non-US centric. So we're based in the US. Um, most of our readers uh, are in the US, but a lot of them, something like 40, 45% come from other parts of the world based on the, the most recent data we have. And it's, um, so we try to approach covering global affairs with um, an eye toward uh, treating countries on their own terms rather than just what those developments mean for people in the US or whatever country and, and really going deep, going, providing deep analysis and nuance for, for people who, you know, maybe they need it for their work or maybe they're just really curious about what's going on in the world. Um, we're 100% subscriber funded um, so we don't have any advertising on the site. It's all institutional and individual subscribers. 
um, I'll end the plug there. And so my role is to, yeah, commission, edit articles from contributors, um, whether they're freelance journalists who are based in a certain country we're covering or think tank analysts or academics. I edit their work and uh, we publish it. I also write periodically, mostly about um, East Asia, Japan and the Koreas, but I'm also really interested in South, uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, I write periodically about different topics and I also host the podcast that you mentioned, which is called Trend Lines. And excuse me, that's a, a different interview every week with, um, with an expert or a journalist or someone who's you know, qualified to, uh, to comment extensively on a certain topic. And so, yeah, you can check those out wherever you get your podcasts. So was this, um, you know, working there, you graduated with, you know, international relations. I guess the question I have um, as well, because I graduated with a policy I degree is, you know, for aspiring young people who are going in that direction of, you know, poli sci or journalism, um, how did you end up landing as editor, you know, uh, where you work at today? And, you know, what was sort of the path to get to where you are now? This question actually has a lot to do with my ASIJ background because my first job in dirt journalism was uh, with TBS, the Japanese television network. Uh, technically, it's actually JNN, which is like the news branch of TBS because TBS also broadcasts like dramas and um, you know variety shows and stuff like that, as, as you know. But uh, Graham Nelson, who's uh, a few years above us, I think he graduated in 2002, I could be wrong from ASIJ, but he was also in DC when I was there, just graduating from, from grad school. Um, pretty vibrant ASIJ alumni community in DC. A lot of, a lot of people there that, that um, I either kept in touch with after graduating or reconnected with when I landed in DC. Um, anyway, Graham was working as a producer for TBS. And just as I was graduating from um, my master's program at SAIS, he reached out and asked me if I'd be interested in applying for the job that he was about to leave because he thought, you know, it'd be a good fit given my Japanese skills. I had never had a journalism job before, but I had always been, you know, I've always been a news junkie. I love reading news and, and I've always uh, loved learning about the world and, and all these different things. I've always thought a career in journalism could be cool, but I never really had a, an entryway into it. And so when Graham approached me about it, I thought, yeah, why not? I should apply. And it, and it went pretty quickly. I was accepted. I got a job offer. Um, and, and that was that. So it was really that kind of ASIJ connection that brought me to where I am now because the five years at TBS really kind of gave me a foundation for, in journalism, uh, specifically international journalism, um, that allowed me to you know, come to WPR and, and immediately start to, to thrive here as well. When it comes to, you mentioned, you know, sort of leveraging your Japanese skills at TBS, in mm -hmm. what ways um, did your job necessitate using Japanese? I wouldn't say it necessitated it. We actually, I actually had a, a colleague who, who didn't speak any Japanese who was also a producer, but it definitely, definitely helped a lot because um, a lot of the correspondents that would come over from uh, Tokyo for, um, you know, stints in the DC bureau were, uh, a lot of times they were, um, I'm never sure how to say this in English, but you know, they were like bicultural kind of, they had spent time overseas. Uh, they, you know, a lot of them had gone to school at, at American universities or European universities and, and could speak English really well. But then some of them were, were, you know, either specialized in different parts of the world and didn't have as much English. So to be able to communicate with them in Japanese, um, was a big asset and also just to be knowledgeable about the news landscape and the political landscape in Japan, which was where our audience was based was, was a big asset as well. That's really interesting. Um, what you mentioned about in regards to knowing what's going on in Japan. So as you mentioned, it does seem like a lot of the, you know, this media landscape, as, as you mentioned, the start is very much sort of rooted on, well, how does it affect the U S you know, how does it affect, the UK. So yeah. with what you guys do at WPR, I was wondering what would be sort of concrete examples of an event that was very localized, but maybe reported in a way that was kind of like, oh, well, because this, you know, event A occurred, it was, it's going to affect the US in this way. But instead, you guys took that same story and reported it in a way that was more sort of, uh, I guess, exploring the effects uh, that it would have more on the local populace. 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. So one example I would give is the uh, jihadist insurgency that's going on right now in West Africa uh, that has increasingly gotten a lot of attention. Um, there are a lot of violent extremist groups operating in in what's known as the Sahel, which is like an area right underneath the Sahara Desert. It's like a semi-arid belt that covers uh, parts of Nigeria, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, and a few other countries. And it's become very violent uh, and unsafe over the past decade or so. This is an issue that is often portrayed kind of simplistically and, and sort of with an eye toward, you know, what kind of threat these groups might pose to the West, like, you know, groups like Boko Haram and, and the Islamic State affiliate and the Al Qaeda affiliates that operate in the region, how much capability do they have? Can they strike targets in Europe or even in the United States? And I don't want to say that we're the only ones that take a different approach, because there have been a lot of journalists and a lot of outlets that, that cover this in a more localized way. But there's a lot of fascinating dynamics behind the scenes, if you, if you sort of, you know, take a deeper look at what's going on. Um, a lot of times these groups are taking advantage of uh, situations that have long, long historical roots and are rooted in economic grievances in the region, things like, you know, conflicts over land and co access to resources, um, tribal disputes. And, and they're, they're taking advantage of those things and, and exacerbating them, trying to sort of, you know, set two sides against each other to fight. This is, this is, all of this is just stuff I've learned from editing uh, contributors who have written for WPR about it. But when you start to like really look at what's driving these conflicts and what's causing uh, these, this violence to just continue on and on and on year after year, and there have, there have been international efforts to address it by, um, you know, countries in the region. And also France has been leading a multinational force in the region. But the, the drivers of that conflict are really complex, really nuanced, and really fascinating and, and transcend beyond just what the implications might be for, for you, the U.S. and the West. You went into journalism and it worked out, right, but through TBS and whatnot. A lot of other graduates, at least for, for me, uh, you know, at Cal went on to go to law school. So for you, at any point, was there a moment where you were thinking, all right, you know, maybe I will delve into another industry or from the get-go, when you entered TBS, was it just stay in journalism or bust? There was, I think there was always a little bit of a, a you know, sense of like, is this really what I want to be doing? I, I never, you know, I, I knew a lot of friends in college and, and in grad school who kind of had this drive to a certain, toward a certain career, you know, like I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a rabbi, I want to be, you know, a musician, whatever, what have you. I never really had that. I always kind of felt like I could identify a few, you know, my strengths and weaknesses, things I'm good at, things I'd rather stay away from. But I never really had that singular um, drive to, to just focus on one thing. So journalism felt good for me in that sense, because every day is different in journalism. You're, you're always learning about something else and, and you're paid to learn about the world and, and spread understanding to other people um, that, you know, it's not as well paid as, as certain other professions like, you know, working in finance or maybe working in law, but, um, but it feels like a good life to me. And it's, it's interesting too, when it comes to linguistics, because journalism clearly, you know, has a heavy say in regards to, you know, how one uses language. But mm. I'm curious about your story is, you know, you are one of those rare people that were able to navigate both English and Japanese at the highest level, right? I think for Japanese, uh, for the viewers, you know, we, we were in school together, right? You were at the highest level, right, um, at Japanese. And obviously, you, you went on to, you know, fairly prominent schools that are difficult, I imagine. Um, so when it comes to your writing today, do you write at all in Japanese? Because everything I read was in English. And how is that sort of landscape? Because I know there's a few people who write in both languages, but they're kind of a rarity. So for us bilinguals, do people at some point kind of have to choose what language they want to uh, write in if they're involved with media and journalism? I don't want to say you have to choose because I think there are probably people like you mentioned who can really write in well in both languages. For me, I, I felt like if, if you really want to get good at writing, it's, it's really hard to do it in, in a second language. And, you know, I, I hesitate to call Japanese a second language for me because I was pretty much learning English and Japanese simultaneously growing up in Japan being born there. Um, 
but the reality was that, you know, ASIJ was um, a mostly English curriculum. My, my parents were speaking English with me at home. Most of the stuff I was reading was in English. I loved, um, you know, a lot of the, some of the books I read in Japanese. And, and when I was at TBS, actually, I, I did have a chance to like write a few um, news scripts in Japanese and, and do some like on air reporting, actually. So that was an opportunity to use that skill. But it was it was a it was a, a good learning experience for me because everything I would write in Japanese, even if I thought it turned out pretty well, pretty well, the correspondents there who um, would review it would would take a red pen to it and just like mark it, mark it up all over and just revise it. And um, part of that has to do with journalistic writing. Journalistic writing is its own beast in whatever language you're talking about. And there are all these like, there are all these terms and, and uh, turns of phrase that you wouldn't be familiar with if, you know, most people in Japan who just watch the news wouldn't really know how to, how to write like that. It's just kind of a skill you pick up in the profession. Similar to you know journalism, journalistic writing in English, I would think. Anyway, that's kind of a long answer to your question. The short answer being that no, I don't think you have to choose. But for me, it felt like I had to choose in order to get good at it. You mentioned at home, your, your parents spoke English. Were were your parents speaking any Japanese at all, or were you the only Japanese? No, in- no. My brother uh, Joseph, you know, he also speaks fluent Japanese. Um, my parents never really they 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 you know picked up some basic phrases, but they were in Japanese teaching English in what was mostly an immer- immersion curricula in Japanese universities. So they never really, um, you know, got to a point where they could speak Japanese fluently. So yeah, it was, it was uh, all pretty much all English at home and a lot of Japanese outside of the household with, you know, you and other friends at ASIJ, friends from the neighborhood, things like that. And when you went on to the States, was it a sort of conscientious topic for you uh, to maintain that level of Japanese by you know, maybe joining Japanese clubs or reading Japanese manga. Like what was your methodology of, of keeping up the, your language level? I wasn't too conscientious about it, to be perfectly honest with you. Like I, I didn't actively seek out opportunities to speak Japanese in college. I, I did kind of, we, I did kind of just naturally, you know, befriend some Japanese uh, students. Um, there was a, a community of ASIJ alumni, as I mentioned in DC, you know, who I always enjoyed kind of speaking Japanese with or speaking that sort of mix of English and Japanese that, uh, you know, that you and I are familiar with um, and that a lot of ASIJ folks are also familiar with too. But, um, but yeah, I wasn't that, in, I, I didn't really make uh, too much of an effort. And then for that reason, I think at various points in my life, my Japanese did get quite rusty, especially like when I was living in Vietnam, there was no opportunity to use Japanese there, obviously. So it, it did get like, I would speak Japanese maybe on the phone with my brother every now and then. And I would just be realizing, wow, I, I used to know a lot more words. <laughs> you know. Um, then, uh, then with TBS, I think that might've been the height of my Japanese abilities just because I was using it so much more and learning so many new words um, when I was there. Now it's probably gotten rusty again. That's really intriguing to hear how the ups and downs, right? Yeah, the swings. Lately, I, I've had opportunities to talk to, uh, you know, th- through this application called Clubhouse. There's, you know, people can sort of connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, cool. Like, I've heard about Clubhouse. Yeah, and one of the most common questions I get from mothers who have their kids at international schools is, you know, how do I make sure they can speak both languages? But as your mm. experience, as well as mine, sort of illustrate, people can really gain and, you know, <laughs> like really polish their linguistic skills in short periods of time, but also they can just go off to places like South Korea or Vietnam and Mm -hmm. those uh, language skills quickly uh, just disappear into thin air. So in a sense, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter obviously what you build up until age 18, but Mm -hmm. so much of it can, can be gained or lost. And uh, yeah, I I would say that foundation stays there. That foundation stays there even after it's lost, because I definitely felt like you could, you know, rebuild it after, after a period of not speaking it for a while. Um, I think there, you know, it's an interesting point about like how bilingualism is developed too, because I feel like I've seen studies that show that um, having that sort of stratification of where you're speaking certain languages, like if you're speaking a certain language at home, but another language in other contexts, um, associating a certain environment with a certain language, I believe is helpful to develop bilingualism. Um, having that routine, I think helps your brain develop it at an early stage. Point that, that foundation, I guess, yeah, it doesn't go, mm-hmm. but as you mentioned with the rustiness, I'm sure you and I sometimes feel that being away. Yeah, from Tokyo absolutely. For a while. <laughs> 
And you uh, mentioned earlier, you were in Vietnam for a bit. So how does that Vietnam episode sort of integrate into this story of Elliot Waldman? <laughs> um, Vietnam was a, a, a volunteer program that I did after college. I, I liked college a lot, but I think uh, at the end of it, when I graduated uh, in 2009, I kind of felt like I was ready for a different environment. I didn't really want to just go right into the job market after that, partly because it was the great recession, the financial crisis at the time, you know, um, spring 2009, the job market was not great. But, but also just mostly because I, I wanted, kind of wanted an adventure. Um, so I, I did this volunteer program. It's called Volunteers in Asia. It's a small nonprofit based in San Francisco um, that, that kind of does, I would say, you know, Peace Corps-like programs, but centered on, um, on East Asia, especially Southeast Asia and China, um, sending volunteers to different areas. And they also have kind of an exchange student, exchange program that uh, brings students from that part of the world over to the U.S., I think that, that I didn't really have much visibility into that. But um, yeah, I spent one year in rural Vietnam in, north, in the Northeast, um, in a city called Tanghua, which is three and a half hours south of, of Hanoi. It, it's in a, a very um, poor rural part of the country. So I was there teaching English to mostly older postgraduate students who were preparing to go overseas for scholarships and, and were studying to pass uh, you know, the TOEFL test or the, the, the other one, I think it's called the IELTS you know, these standardized uh, English proficiency tests that are requirements to study at universities in the US or Europe or Australia, or what have you. Um, so I was helping them prepare for that. And then my second year, I was in uh, central Vietnam in Hue, which is a, a bit more well-known. It's, it's kind of on the tourist path. It's the ancient capital of Vietnam. Really lovely city, really wonderful place. Um, and I was there uh, volunteering with a nonprofit that does forestry conservation and, and poverty alleviation in some of the um, sort of rainforest communities around there. Both really cool experiences. Yeah, I, I definitely think that the volunteer experience in Vietnam was, um, was very formative for me. It definitely really catalyzed my curiosity about the world and my desire to, to just keep learning and, and motivated me to go to grad school. And, you know, grad school in turn motivated me to, to go into uh, journalism in sort of an indirect way. So it, it definitely is a, a prominent link in the chain. That's really intriguing to how, you know, most people, especially for international schools, tend to, you know, veer into the more lucrative industries, they say like finance, or if they spend the time, you know, mm -hmm. when you decided to go that NGO, NPO route, you know, volunteerism, what was sort of the ethos behind that and, and why, and I, maybe you're just placed there, but why Vietnam? You know, why not the other area, uh, countries in that area? Um, I, I specifically chose Vietnam because my senior year in college, I took a class in Southeast Asian history. And um, I was fascinated by the, the sort of story of Vietnam as a country, um, given that, you know, it has a, a incredibly sad history of, of repeated invasions by foreign powers and repeated wars, first, you know, China, then France, then the United States. Incredibly brutal, incredibly tragic. But then, you know, over the past few decades, it's really risen to become an economic powerhouse in its own right and a regional power in Southeast Asia. Um, and, and I just thought that, you know, there was, there was something there, that there had to be a, a story of resilience, a story of struggle, a story of um, national cohesion, uh, a lot of different stories to be told that, that I was just really interested in. And, and I wanted to go there and, and experience it directly. Um, the, the food was amazing too. So I, you know, I can't discount that aspect. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, in terms of the volunteerism route, I think it was just my idealism, you know, I, I, I'm less idealistic now, but especially when I was graduating college, I, I very much had the sort of um, idea in my head that, uh, that I had had this ex extraordinarily privileged upbringing and extraordinarily uh, privileged life of, uh, you know, going to a, a very good school in Tokyo, having this multicultural, bicultural upbringing, um, going to another good school in DC, being in DC, um, and yeah, just kind of wanting to, to, to try to give back and to try to 
while enriching myself, you know, help others enrich their lives. How successful I was in that endeavor, you know, is, is uh, I guess, jury still out. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that was the motivation. Normally, I try to deviate from politics. But given that, you know, you work for the World Politics Review, I think you mentioned <laughs> Very intriguing to me. Uh, uh-huh. where you said you were more idealistic when you were yeah. younger, less mm-hmm. idealistic now. Can you elaborate on that point? Part of it, I think, is just, uh, uh, you know, as, you, as we get older, we just kind of learn a little bit more about the limitations of our own abilities to actually, well, let me backtrack a little bit. I don't want to say that we're limited in our abilities as, as, you know, individual sort of change agents, if you will. Um, because I do think, you know, everyone does have that potential. Maybe that's some latent idealism that's still present in me that, that thinks that. But, you know, I do think that there's, you start to learn about the world as it is, the world as it functions, you know, the, the drivers of the world, the, the reasons why certain um, phenomena in the world, violent conflict, uh, poverty and, and hunger and things like that are, are ever present. And, and I think that does sort of have an impact I really think that, you know, everyone at one point in their life or another kind of has a a awakening moment where they just realize that a lot of problems in the world are out of their own hands to change. So, yeah, I think that part of a big part of that experience for me was was in Vietnam and and also traveling around Asia to, you know, places like India and Cambodia and just kind of seeing rural poverty, urban poverty up close, and, and just realizing how intractable of a problem it is and how difficult it is to solve. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an int- intriguing topic, especially, you know, given our, we're both in our mid 30s now. And I think there was that quote, uh, maybe it's like a British politician, I guess you'd be more aware than me, who said something like, if you're at 18, you're not liberal, you don't have a heart, but at 30, mm. if you're not conservative, you don't have a brain. And it's something I think yeah, about a lot. Exactly. I mean, obviously, you know, Berkeley liberal, um, I'm not <laughs> shy about that. Uh, right. But with that said, uh, as, as, you, as you sort of stated as well, I don't know if it's the way I view the world in regards to my personal constraints, but it's definitely different. It's different. And it's hard to simply, I think, put us on a spectrum, right? Right, left. I feel like that's very forced. But mm, if yeah, we're yeah. on that forced, you know, dichotomous sort of perspective, then definitely there is that shift, right? Um, but anyways, uh, enough about yeah, that. having to pay taxes <laughs> does a lot for that. I think <laughs> <laughs> I was just having point. this conversation. Uh, <laughs> I was just having this conversation with my partner, and I was just like, "Man, why are we having to pay all this tax?" And I'm just like, you know, and it just like there was a moment of awakening where like, "Oh my God, I." have you know, become that middle-aged guy who's just like not worried about paying taxes. I mean, I would imagine for you, I mean, you're, you're exposed to younger people in your day-to-day life, you know, and as a, as an educator. So, you know, maybe you have an easier time, like holding that sort of, you know, that brighter spirit, that idealism in your heart. I think most definitely. Yeah. That, uh, I think this new generation and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but actually the current high schoolers are Gen Z right? People under 23. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's actually another generation already in our elementary schools. I think under third grade, their generation. What's it called? Is there a name for it yet? They they think they're going to call alpha. So they they got a pretty cool name. Okay. Start at the Greek alphabet. Yeah. So we're just going to go right back to A, right? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. But anyways, yeah. And at least the positive things I can say about that generation is definitely when it comes to things like social issues and just I guess the way we would view things like environmental conservation and whatnot, they're just like light years ahead. Like Mm. they're just, I think just starting with knowledge, right? Knowledge and they're aware. Like when we were younger, sure, there was the recycling bin, but I mean, it was just something that our parents told us to do, right? Put it in the recycling bin. Yeah. And And we naively just assumed that it would magically turn into, you know, all those plastic bottles would turn into like, a t-shirt or a shopping bag, you know, and yeah. then you become an adult and you learn that it just all goes to Indonesia, you know, <laughs> and it's just like that. I mean, that's another loss of idealism and innocence right there. That's true. Um, it, it's definitely something I, I think about a lot. I'm sure you do too, especially in, in your work, right? This idea. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. You know. Sorry if all this I'm saying is like super dark, by the way, I feel like I'm being like very <laughs> pessimistic here. <laughs> no, we, can, no, we, can, I, we, can, we can talk more optimistically about stuff. 
it's it can only get better from here right and i, yeah. I sort of teed it up i sort of teed it up i think yeah, to take it in that direction all right so switching gears to something maybe a little bit more optimistic apart from us having to pay taxes is um <laughs> taxes are good i'm not i'm not i'm not gonna you know beat up on taxes because taxes pay for public services and edu- everything public education and healthcare and everything we need so you know for the record i'm pro-tax i just want to put that out there Good say <laughs> <laughs> um is uh ace ij i know we, we touched upon it a little bit so far but maybe to expand on it a lot of it you attended ace ij lifer mm, uh, yes k through 12 k through 12 uh, graduate 2005 in what ways has ace ij affected who you are today there's a lot of different ways uh, some of which are tangible and others Maybe tangible is not the right not the right word. Some of which I'm conscious of, and others that I'm probably not conscious of. Um, definitely, I think the ones that are conscious of is the you know the, the 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 teachers I had at ASIJ definitely made a big impact on the kinds of stuff I wanted to study and the the kind of sort of professional trajectory I wanted to follow. I think I definitely you know really had a, a lot of teachers that I can say um, inculcated me with uh, a. a a good amount of critical thinking skills and, and, and taught me the importance of not taking anything um, at face value and questioning everything. Right. Um, I want to, you know, thinking specifically of like Andrew Hoover and uh, Natalie O'Connor in middle school, um, Kathy Krauth and, and Bobby Ghosh in, in high school, were all just like excellent uh, teachers in the social studies and history curriculums curricula that, that taught me the importance of, of, of reading things and just like understanding, you know, the agenda of who's saying them or who's writing them and the importance of that, even just like with textbooks, for instance, you know, um, that just made me really curious and, 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 and interested in history and, and sort of like the, the, the way different histories are told, how certain voices are elevated or erased, depending on, you know, who's writing the history, things like that. I, I think, you know, um, definitely made me more curious in the social sciences and the humanities than in the, the STEM fields, for instance. Um, maybe that was just sort of like the kind of uh, person I was turning out to be at that point. But, um, but yeah, and, and I think in terms of more broadly, the sort of uh, the friends I had, um, the multicultural milieu of ASIJ definitely gave me a unique vantage point on life. And it really taught me the importance of, of diversity. That's really something I continue to value. You know, it's something I continue to, to champion, I like to think, in everything I do. Um, I will say that, you know, for, for all those pros, I think, I'm not really sure how it is now, but um, ASIJ in retrospect, it tends to socialize people. And, and I would be curious to hear if you agree with this. It tends to socialize students into this very upper class kind of dynamic of, of you know, at risk of using a sort of, loaded word uh, the global elite you know because like a lot of students at at asij would uh, you know come through asij cycle through as they would other international schools as a result of their parents uh being you know corporate executives or diplomats and i never really got the feeling that there was much effort to try to encourage students to engage with the issues of of economic inequality and and poverty and poverty that, you know, that are really prevalent in the world. Um, at least with, in terms of the student body, there just wasn't a lot of diversity socioeconomically. Mm. Yeah, I would uh, 100% agree with that perspective. And I would actually go one step further and say that there's almost this irony, you know, again, it's a rather loaded term, but, you know, individuals who could be possibly considered as the global elite who on, are you know presenting themselves as people who really care about inequality and they really care about you know global issues and they'll do mm-hmm. everything that they need to do until their 12th grade you know senior ends and then almost yeah. like a light switch is off it's like all of a sudden none of those things matter you know once they got into mm-hmm. the college of their choice now they're you know uh, pursuing what they want to and from a very sort of more basic perspective i don't see an issue with what people want to do with their lives but the problem I have is more of what I just mentioned is the irony of, of these individuals who really sort of situate, you know, they try to portray themselves as these, you know, global saviors and 
global mind, you know, global being global minded. And if you're not, it's kind of like, you don't have to be like, there's plenty of people who go through high school saying they don't care about global issues. They just want to make a lot of money and then they go on and make a lot of money. And that's, that's yeah. totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. But I think the problem as long as they pay their taxes, as long as they pay their taxes. Yes. I think the problem is when people really begin to sort of, yeah, try to portray themselves in one way and then um, sort of, again, just everything's forgotten right, when right. they graduate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that that's a, that's a very apt criticism for, for all the international schools, not just ASIJ. Um, in regards to, you know, our time at ASIJ, you mentioned humanities, social studies. Can you think of specific episodes uh, that really helped or really that really were, mo were memorable for you in regards to your educational experience there, especially at the secondary level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a lot. Uh, one experience I remember specifically, it was, I believe, Andrew Hoover's social studies class in maybe seventh grade or eighth grade. But, you know, he had us uh, read a, a history textbook that was called Call to Freedom. And the cover of the textbook was like a gigantic Statue of Liberty. And, and that just gives you a sense of the way the textbook is going to be framed, doesn't it? It's, it's going to be borderline propaganda. It's, it's not going to have much about, you know, the Native American experience, the African American experience, the Asian American experience, um, the LGBT experience, the women's rights experience, the labor rights movements. And, and, and true to form, it, it kind of, you know, it would have sort of tokenistic, I would say, descriptions of things like that, but never really got into detail. And, you know, when it came to things like the, the manifest destiny, you know, there wasn't really much sort of criticism of the ideology that, that led to that, for instance. Um, so, you know, he would have us read chapters from that book alongside, I think he, he, he had us read like uh, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States or, or other volumes that took a bit more of a critical approach and, and aimed to elevate and amplify voices that were traditionally left out of um, mainstream history curricula. And I thought that was, um, at the time, I was, that, was, that was an eye opener for me. You know, I thought that was a great way to approach uh, a curriculum like that. And, and you know, because it wasn't like he was pushing it on us. It wasn't like he was saying, you know, here's Howard Zinn. You've got to read this guy. You've got to just buy into it. He was putting these two options forward and saying, look, you know, use your own critical thinking skills and, and analyze these two sources and see which one you think is more credible, you know, or see which one you, th you, you think sort of resonates more with your values as a person. So yeah, I, I think I, that that made a big impact on me. Um, another episode I would uh, give is uh, Kathy Kraut's Japan seminar course, where you know we went to um, we went to Okinawa for part of that uh, for part of that course, and and that was a really big um, big experience for me too, just seeing firsthand the impact of what I think Japan still doesn't acknowledge as an ethnic as an ethnic minority. And, and the, 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 the oppression at the hands of the state, the impact of the military bases, the utter sort of, uh, the, the fact that Japan just didn't really even give lip service to the idea of self-determination for the Okinawan people. And, and she, you know, put together a great string of, of interviews for us and how to speak to guests there who are, you know, activists protesting the bases or protesting, you know, um, the Japanese occupation from the get-go. Um, so yeah, that, that also left a big impact on me too. Um, yeah. I was wondering, um, not to get too specific, but one, sure. so it stuck with me was, um, there was the, uh, this group in Japan, I think they're still active called Tsukuru, something Tsukuru no Kai maybe. And, and they're like, uh, basically textbook reformers who want to basically have nothing negative in the textbook about Japan. And I remember mm. as a class, we actually yes. met them. Yes, yes. Uh, so I was wondering if you could maybe explain uh, to anyone who's listening what, what we did and because that, that was incredibly impactful in regards to I'm, my academic. I'm really glad you brought that up. I, I had, um, that experience had slipped my mind. But yes, um, I remember it was part of a curriculum, I, I think, uh, that focused on, on Yaskuni as well and the sort of the way history is portrayed um, at, at that shrine and the museum that's attached to it. And I remember going there and just like going through the sort of the, the way that history, the lead up to world war two and the lead up to Pearl Harbor is portrayed. Um, and just thinking, oh, wow, this is in, this is 
crazy, you know, just like none of this happened the way they uh, portrayed it to be. And I was just like this, you know, it really illustrates the lengths to which people will go to portray history in a light that's favorable to them. And that episode you mentioned with the, with the gentleman, I, I can't remember his name, but he, yeah, he was against, or he was in favor of, of having textbooks that, uh, that really minimized Japan's war and uh, Japan's role in the war in East Asia um, with, with regard to, you know, comfort women and, and a lot of the atrocities that were committed in, in the Korean peninsula and in China. And I remember he specifically took a lot of issues with um, Iris Chang, the author of uh, The Rape of Nanjing and her mm -hmm. book and her historical account of that episode. Um, he did not have very nice things to say about her. And it, it was, I remember that, uh, were we part of the same group at that? I remember it got kind of heated, sure. it got a little bit contentious. Well, I, I think you, you, yeah, I think you asked some questions. Was it me? <laughs> <laughs> you may have been stoking the fires, but oh, um, man. I, was, I was surprisingly yeah. quiet, I think for, for that uh, session, but uh, right. it's interesting. But yeah, no, that, I mean, it, I, I had to respect him for, for you know, agreeing, because he probably knew that, you know, that he was going to be facing an adversarial audience based on who his audience was. Um, so, you know, uh, due respect to him for, for actually, you know, agreeing to speak with us. But, um, but yeah, that was very illuminating, too. It, it reminds me, uh, there's this author that I really like, whose books I've been really enjoying, um, Viet Thanh Nguyen. He's a, a Vietnamese-American uh, author. He's written a couple of really good books. One is called um, The Committed. I think that's the most recent one. It's a sequel to his earlier one called The Sympathizer. But he has a line from one of his books um, that... Uh, I think it, it goes, war is, all wars are fought twice, once on the battlefield and the second time in memory. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that episode that you brought up really, really highlights that. Going back to that, that point of uh, when we spoke to those, uh, you know, the Ascuni issues, I, I think a lot when I, when I do this podcast too, I think there's a lot of people who want to sort of put high school behind and that's understandable, right? We, we were all stupid in one way or another, both you and I. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but so much of uh, who we are today, I feel like comes from that. And just speaking to you now, so reminded me how I think in our contingent of Japan seminar, there was another individual, I'd love to actually have him on the podcast, Jin Yoshikawa, who I would always debate with him about just various historical issues. Uh -huh. And it was interesting when I, you know, we look at the three of our profiles today. Uh, I teach debate at a high school, you know, you write about politics um, <laughs> at WPR, and he's a yeah. lawyer. So I just thought that was really funny. <laughs> a, a lot of us sort of, uh, you can sort of figure out what we're going to do, even from, you know, age 15, 16. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is funny. All, the, all, that, all that arguing, you know, in, in high school, definitely, um, you know, it, it, uh, it creates a certain degree of path dependency, I suppose. Yeah, sometimes that passion keeps going, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And hopefully to your, you know, uh, Hopefully you'd be happy to hear that uh, I was able to speak recently to a young grad, uh, Hugh McGuire, class of 2020. Cool. So he'd be 15 years younger than us, and Japan Sem is still going strong. So that's um, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I actually um, I, I had a chance to reconnect with Kathy Krauth briefly um, a few years ago because I actually went to Okinawa for a freelance uh, project that I was working on, just like putting together a research trip for for kind of a private client and. She actually put me in touch with a few of the people who um, who were on that, who sort of helped put together the itinerary for the trip. And one of the women who served as as the guide for myself and my client when we went there, uh, she thought she remembered who I was from from the high school trip. She definitely remembered Kathy Krauth, obviously, but she was just like, "Yeah, I think I remember you." Yeah. I had more hair then, obviously, so it was easier to to tell. But <laughs> I, was, I was thinking it might not have been a coincidence because there were a lot of uh, white people at our school. But you know, for people who don't know, you're about what six two, six three, and you had blonde yeah. hair. So right. you stuck out even and, and, and spoke know. Japanese fluently. So that probably left a bit of an impression. Yeah. It's so that's, that's great. That's great to hear that JSM is, is still going. I thought that was a really good. Um, I thought that was a great, uh, great course, great initiative to, uh, to start up a class like that. Yeah, I think. Uh, and what you mentioned with Andrew Hoover, it definitely speaks to, you know, his acumen as a person uh, in regards to there's plenty of educators, I think, that have very sort of liberal ideas but there's not enough educators mm -hmm. that teach it in the right way, right? Teach it in the way that yes, lets learners yes. explore it. It's very easy to say, Hey, you know, this is wrong. This is right. But I think uh, mm -hmm. in that sense, we went through virtually the same education because we were, you know, same year, took similar classes. You probably took more. Mm -hmm. than, 
Uh, but uh, you know, <laughs> we, uh, I think we were very much uh, the beneficiary of that type of education that was more like, hey, figure it out on your own. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I think it's, it was definitely an approach um, that, that said, we're going to equip, equip you with the tools you need, but we're not going to tell you how to use those tools, you know, which I, and I really respect that for sure. Towards the end here, I think we could deviate to sort of less academic, less political topics. Um, Let's do it. That we just briefly touch upon since the two of us are here. I don't even know if this is going to stay on air. <laughs> <laughs> You, that's, the you luxury the of, that's the luxury of doing a recording right? you can decide what you want to trim later on so you know as we wrap things up here uh just a few minutes i think since the two of us are here you know we were, used to be part of a rock band for people who are not familiar the grape that was my first rock band that <laughs> was one of the only two rock bands <laughs> i was part of and um you know you play the drums quite avidly um you still a big drummer yeah yeah um Actually, I mean, um, it's funny because this, the ASIJ connection plays into this too, because when I was in DC, Dave McCagg had a band. Dave McCagg uh, was a ASIJ grad who was one year above us, I think. One year, two years? Two years, three two years. years. Three years, <laughs> yeah. Two years, two years, it's, yeah. it's hard, I mean, we've, be, we've become very close since then, so it kind of, uh, it's hard for me to recollect precisely, but um, I know that we, be, we became very close in summer day camp, which we haven't talked about, but I think that's another one of the, um, a really cool institution that, that ASIJ has put in place. And, and um, I have some really fond memories from being a counselor and then an English teacher at summer day camp. But, but, uh, but yeah, so Dave and I got to know each other that way. And then we both wound up in DC. I was in college and he, he had studied government in college. So he, you know, kind of came to DC and started looking for jobs there. Seemed like a natural fit. And we wound up playing in a band together with um, another ASIJ grad, Daniel Dickinson, who whose brother was also, who was part of the great Michael Dickinson, I think. Michael yeah. Dickinson was our basis. Oh, yes. so yeah, everything's coming full circle now, man. Everything is, is, <laughs> is interconnecting. And um, yeah, so the three of us had a band with, with one of David's uh, friends, Ethan Gormley, who plays trombone. And um, it was called, and also actually Gino Melillo, who was from our grade, was, was part of that band. I shouldn't forget because he, He's not in D.C. anymore, but the, for, a, for a few years he was in D.C. And um, we played a lot of shows together. Um, really fun, really fun band. And we have some recordings. Uh, we're actually doing one now. We're, we're sort of recording them remotely, which is the first time I've ever done it before. So um, we're recording all the different tracks separately. I'm, I'm playing drums on my electronic kit here at home, sending the parts to Daniel, who's uh, in addition to being a, a genius guitarist and bass player and he also has uh, insane recording and, and mixing mastering skills too. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I send my parts to him. Dave records his guitar parts and everyone, everyone just sends their parts to Daniel and he mixes them together. And, and I have to ask, uh, what is the name of the band? It's called the Dirty Destroyers Orchestra. Sorry, I should have said that. DDO <laughs> for short. Yeah. Awesome. I, I feel like you, uh, you can't really go right or wrong when it comes to band names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i th i think it's easy to nail it but there's just a lot of yeah there's a lot of band names that you think like i i mean ddo is all I, I know dave would probably um not be happy with me for saying this but i feel like it's one of these names that you kind of just settle on it and it's just like okay well instead of trying to come up with something different let's just go with that there's a lot That's of band names out there it, right? like red hot chili peppers you know yeah in hindsight yeah. it's like what yeah <laughs> that that crazy gang of rapscallions <laughs> well on that note uh i like to at the very end ask the guest um what is coming up in their lives for the next few years next few mm. decades so okay please tell us what is going on with uh, elliot walden so my my partner and i uh, we we live together right now in brooklyn she and i are buying a house together we're buying an apartment in new york and it's uh it's been quite an experience it's been quite a ride Buying an apartment anywhere, I guess, is, is kind of a, a big undertaking, but especially in the New York real estate market, it's been just like this pretty crazy experience that, um, that yeah, it's been like a, a huge learning curve for us. We're just having to learn about all kinds of different things. And uh, so that's, that's moving forward. We're planning to move in this summer. So that's sort of what's been taking up a lot of my um, time and resources outside of, outside of the workaday life. 
other than that, I think I'm just looking forward to getting vaccinated. The vaccination calendar is starting to open up here in New York for people in our age group. So we're hoping to try to make a, an appointment pretty soon. And um, I really miss traveling. You know, I really miss traveling to new places and, and being exposed to different cultures. And, and, you know, just like that whole experience is something that I know it sounds kind of cliche, but it, it's just like it's, it's something that is so refreshing and life affirming for me. So. I, I'm looking forward to getting back to that. I think, you know, we, we definitely need to try and find a way to do it in a way that's that's more ecologically sustainable. But I do think that that being able to travel and experience different cultures firsthand is is like really one of the great positives of globalization. And, and I think is also a, a big contributor to, to peace and understanding in the world. So, you know, I'm looking forward to, to getting back to that. But, um, but yeah, what about you, man? Uh, what's what's new? What's coming up with you? We haven't all this time um, I've been uh, talking about me. I want to, you know, turn the interviewer's <laughs> microphone back over to you. There comes the podcaster in you, huh? No, I don't think anyone's actually asked me this. Um, my, I guess, sort of one minute version of God, the next two, three years would be, uh, mm. I'll be here for two more years in South Korea. Uh, mm. I, I love my job. I love my school. Uh, but, you know, nine years, it's, it's time to sort of move on for new challenges. You've been at the same school for nine years? Uh, it will be nine years after I complete, you know, two more years here. Okay. And, okay. Wow. But yeah, that is a long time. I feel like that's pretty rare for uh, international school teachers to stay at one school for that long. But yeah, I'll, I'll uh, leave there with my wife. Uh, I got my principal cert last year. So uh, maybe the next post might be something more in administration. Okay. Or continue Damn. teaching. Moving up. Yeah. What, what mean, what, what, what are the subjects you teach mainly? Is it uh, like social studies type stuff or? Um... Yeah, I'm a master of none, as, as some would say. Uh, I teach mm. uh, debate, economics, psychology, and AP uh, capstone research, which is basically okay. with, uh, a class where they research one topic. It's almost like a, like a high school version of a master's thesis. So they like, you know, you, you, you learn different research methods and, and, you know, dig into primary documents and stuff like that. Definitely stuck with me. But yeah, that's uh, pretty much where I'm at. And um, any idea where where you might be wind up in two or three years out after after your current stint is up? Well, at least as of this recording, which is uh, what uh, March 31st, <laughs> 2021, mm. the wife and I have our eyes on Bangkok, Taipei and Tokyo. Cool. We still have a mile, though, but one of those three. So you're welcome, obviously, uh, to join us in any of those cities. I would love to, man. Uh, Taipei is definitely on my list. I, I really want to visit um, Taiwan and uh, Bangkok. I've been to a few times. That would be really fun to go back. Tokyo, obviously, I would love to go back. So, yeah, definitely. Let's do it. If, if you do wind up in Bangkok, you might um, wind up in the same place as our mutual friend, Andrew Brown. I think he's heading over there as we speak. Correct. We will, we will meet Andrew Brown and we will uh, <laughs> reminisce. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually caught up with him in Tokyo, as a matter of fact, um, during that trip where I went to Okinawa that I was talking about before on the way back, I had a layover in Tokyo where I spent a day and, and was able to meet up with him. And, and he was actually working at ASIJ Summer Day Camp at the time. And uh, so <laughs> it was kind of funny to hear about, uh, you know, how everyone was doing. Uh, so, you know, one of those like blast from the past moments. It's nice. Crazy. It always comes back to SIJ, huh? And, you know, hopefully you can never leave are... like the song goes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and on that note, uh, that is the end of uh, episode 66. Elliot Waldman coming in, not from D.C., but from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, hope you enjoy that new apartment, buddy. Thanks, man. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for the invitation. Mm -hmm.